Hello, everybody, and welcome to the online worship service of First Methodist Houston. My name is Andy Nixon. I'm one of the pastors of our church. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We're on a series on missions, as you may know, if you've been worshiping with us for the past few weeks. And one of the things we're doing is we're asking everybody who's connected to First Methodist Houston to go an extra mile and help us out and make a gift, a financial gift, to the missions of our church. But before we do that, uh, I thought I would, <laughs> I would talk about a story. Let's kind of let's kind of maybe go at this a different angle. But uh, the other day, you may have seen a couple weeks ago, uh, it, the Blue Origin uh, rocket was launching up, and inside were a few passengers, one of whom was William Shatner, who I know most of you probably remember because he was one of the most uh, prominent actors in one of the most spectacular television shows that has ever been the original Star Trek. And so uh, as this rocket went up, what was happening is Captain Kirk, uh, <laughs> William Shatner, is going really to outer space. And to make the story even more spectacular, he's 90 years old. So here's this 90-year-old actor who played one of the preeminent characters in television history, and he's in this rocket, and he's shooting up to outer space. He was there for about, uh, well, the whole flight was about 11 minutes, about four or five, in weightlessness, but uh, if you haven't uh, seen the interview or read an interview with him when he came back, it is worth it, because the thing changed him in that he actually became the person that he pretended to be as an actor, he was actually somebody who was in a spaceship that went to outer space. Now, it wasn't the Enterprise, and they weren't doing all that stuff, and there weren't Klingons and all that sort of things. But he went to outer space and became the person that he had been pretending to be so long ago. And as he talked about it, not as Captain Kirk, but as William Shatner, it changed him. And he talked about going out of the atmosphere and all of a sudden the blue goes away and all of a sudden you're floating in the blackness. And just to see the earth uh, from that perspective, astronauts actually have a term for that. It's called the overview effect and that it's common when somebody goes to outer space and maybe one day uh, I'll be this, you know, we'll have First Methodist Houston on the moon perhaps. But when people see the earth and they're passing over it from outer space, they're orbiting around it, it changes them because what happens is, is they have an effect uh, or have a perspective that they did not have before. And that simple idea is something that I think is important for us to hold on to, not just as human beings, but as Christians. Because one of the fundamental reasons I believe that Jesus came to be among us and the reason he taught and <laughs> worked and bled and died on our behalf is to change our point of view. So we become people who are less centered on ourselves and more aware of what God is trying to do, not just within us, but in around us on a universal kind of scale. That's what missions, I think, does. And it's why I think missions is so important to the people that get served and the people that need help. Yes, part of what we want to do as Christians is to alleviate the suffering of those in need. But there's also something important that happens in us when we choose to give because all of a sudden we become part of lives connected in real and meaningful ways to folks that we did not know before. And when we walk into our local church or we watch the local news, we realize that we are a part of something. It isn't just about us. It's about all of us. And the more we realize that, the healthier kind of Christian you and I are going to be. Using that as the backdrop, I think it kind of sets the stage for our scripture today. Our scripture is actually part of what's known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus, starting in about John chapter 13 and carrying through our chapter 17. Jesus does nothing but pray. He prays for all sorts of things. He prays for himself. Uh, he prays for the disciples. But what's interesting in our passage is that the people he is praying for are you and me. He prays for the people who will hear the message of the disciples and that they, those future believers, may be as unified with each other and unified with Christ and God the Father as Jesus is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all woven as one. Jesus wants there to be no dilution of the unity of the church. 
And so he is praying that even as you and I come to faith, thousands of years later, 2,000 years after Christ himself walked and taught and did all the things that he did, he does not want there to be any change in the unity of the church. Our heart, his heart, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, one. They beat the same. That is the goal that you and I are to have. And Christ is praying that it happens. Now here maybe we should pause. How you doing? Does your heart, Christ's heart, heart of your neighbor, all beat as one? And there's a tendency, I think, in today's world to beat ourselves up. So let's, let's, let's avoid that. But there have been moments where you have. There have been moments where I have, and I've identified with the, the, my neighbor who's in need, or maybe I've been the person in need, and somebody reaches out to help me, and I'm just grateful. I remember years ago, I tried to run a marathon, and I, I had undertrained, and, and I made it to about the 18-mile mark, and I just was about to collapse. There was a medical tent there, and I looked at them, and I said, where do you go to die? Now, it was an exaggeration. I didn't. But all of a sudden, people moved to help me. Uh, they gave me a little, little blanket. They gave me some Gatorade. They had a doctor who came and checked my pulse. I was fine. I just bit off more than I could chew. But I was in need, and people helped me. So you see, it's this kind of, uh, what's the right word? It's this kind of chemistry. It's this kind of, well, I, I think Jesus would say love for one another. That's supposed to, to coat everything that we do in the sense that when we look at our brother or sister, if they have a need or if they're celebrating something, we, we reach out. If there's a need, we celebrate with them. There is no ego. There is no pride. There is no me. There is no I. And what Jesus is doing in our scripture today is praying that all those forces of individualism and selfishness would go away so that there may be something greater we can see. Like looking at the earth from space above, looking at our lives from heaven above, letting that change us so that we become people who more identify with all those around us than we do so much ourselves. That's the challenge. Now, to kind of think practically for a second, I do think we've experienced this in some way because what Jesus is talking about is team. One of the things we talk about here at First Methodist Houston over and over with members and with our staff is that we are team first. We all work together to solve the problems, to do the things that Christ would have us do. And so there's no place for ego or pride or your own personal agenda. If that's what is kind of writes your ticket, you're going to find church a tough place to be. But when we come together, we can be stronger. Maybe you've experienced this. I know my wife and I, uh, we did a little bit of sports. If you were a sports person, you grew up being on a team, perhaps, or you practiced with a team. And there came a part, you know, a day where after practicing over and over and over and over, you began to move as one instead of, you know, being an awkward double play combination where you didn't know the ball was coming from or where necessarily it should go. All of a sudden, you practice it over and over and over, and what happens? All of a sudden, it has a flow, it has a rhythm, it has a chemistry. You realize where the other people are going to be, and they know that they can rely on you. Basketball, football, all sorts of things the same way. Even individual sports, you know, if we're running a track or whatever it is, there comes a day where we practice, we practice, we practice, and it just has a unity to it after a while because we've gotten better. Church, you see, missions, worship, prayer, small groups, all the things that we believe are critical to church is the same way. This is where we practice so that we become more unified with one another. Now, there'll be times that things get in the way. Our neighbor will sin against us. We talked about this last week. What do we do? We work to make sure that forgiveness and reconciliation happen. But beneath all these things, as we talk about unity and, and uh, forgiveness, uh, what Jesus talks about over and over and over in this high priestly prayer is love. We are to love one another. And so what Jesus is praying for as he wants us to be unified with each other and unified with him is that he prays that our hearts will be so incredibly loving that we will feel that connection from the moment we see someone. This is my brother and sister in Christ. This is Jesus who I love. This is God the Father, the Holy Spirit moving in me. And I am instantly attached because I love Christ. I love my Lord. 
I love my brother, I love my sister so much. That's what we are going for. And again, it takes a little practice. But you know what? The thing is, if we practice doing this and with Jesus praying for it, we can achieve it. And it's amazing what people can do when they dedicate themselves to living in sort of a unified team, love my neighbor kind of way. The achievements we can make are tremendous. Uh, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that Deborah and I had the chance to go to New York City and we saw uh, a musical by David Byrne. David Byrne, if you don't know, is the lead singer, or was the lead singer back in the day of the Talking Heads. That's, a, that's another story for another time. But I don't want to give away the show, but one of the things that happened, it was about an hour and 45 minutes straight of music. And one of the things that happened in one part of the show is that uh, this, uh, instead of having a drummer with a, a drum kit where you've got snare and kick and hi-hat and toms and those sorts of things, instead of having one person that did all that, they broke it down. So there was one person on the snare, there was one person on the hi-hat, there was one person who had cymbals, there was one person on the kick drum, there was one person with toms. All these people, instead of just one. And they together formed the rhythm section of this musical. And they were incredible. It was amazing to see how this group of people, individually, talented, yes, but could work together and be so incredibly precise and bring such an energy and chemistry to a room because of what they were able to accomplish together. Now, the thing is, you and I know practice went into this. And so I want to encourage you to say, what are the ways that we can practice as Christians so that we have a chemistry like that. And let me offer you just a few suggestions, although I think there are many. One is we pray. We're in a, a time of prayer and discernment here at First Methodist Houston. Uh, we're going to spend a year in prayer. Uh, we've been doing this for a little over a month now. But prayer is a way in which I think we practice and we learn to make our heart like His. I would ask for you to continue or start if you haven't but to really pray and ask the Lord, what is it that I can do? How is it, Jesus, that you and I can work in such a way to change my heart so that I so love what you are doing and others, I am instantly a part of your plan. And remember that as you pray, Jesus is praying for you. And when those prayers meet, I like what can happen through the power of the Spirit in that combination. The other thing I think we can do is, is to realize that church sort of is. It's practice for us to become the kind of people that Jesus wants us to be. So how would it be for you to up your game uh, when you worship? Uh, maybe it's to take some time and pray before I go to church so that I'm spiritually prepared the moment uh, I either log on uh, or come to the physical church to worship with other believers. Maybe it's a Bible study so that you can really do something. Get into the Gospel of John, for example, and, and study the Word and realize what does it mean that Jesus is praying for me as a future believer and He wants my heart to be unified with His. See, if we pray, if we study, if we're part of a small group, if we're talking to one another about these things, we can become better and grow. Because what Jesus offers us in this scripture passage is a vision of how he expects it to be. And so the challenge for you and I is to live up to that. How is it that we can make sure that every contraction of our heart, every beat of our heart, is one that's also perfectly synchronized with what our Lord would have us feel, would have us say, and have us do? That's where Jesus is praying for us. And with his great help, we can get there. So I don't want you to settle for anything less. You know, when we feel conflict or friction or if we're disappointed, I get it. We have a bad day. It happens. Evil's out there. Satan gets in our way. I understand that too. But Jesus has given us a vision of what's possible and we should not back down. Rather, let's go forward, understanding that when we live this way, loving people completely, purely, and powerfully, we have a chance to be something together that we could never be on our own. Or maybe to say it in a little James T. Kirk style, we could boldly go where no one has gone before. Let's love one another. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word and the challenge it presents to us. May it cause us to grow so that we might be more loving people completely made in your image. We thank you, Jesus, that you are praying for us even as we worship you now. 
you are doing everything that you can in order to cause us to be more like you. So continue your good work. Continue to pray for us and let us respond in faith. All this, Jesus, we give you praise for and we pray for. And we ask that you would simply continue to move in our lives, especially now as we say the words you taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.